Okay, I'm talking with Bill Casing, and uh, Bill Casing is uh, what you might call a pioneer in this uh, whole issue of uh, getting at truth and reality, and specifically in the area of the Apollo moon missions, what happened and what didn't happen. And when the, the module set down on the surface of the moon, the amount of propulsion that would have been required to do that, and it leaves no cloud of dust, no crater, right. Having seen hundreds of rocket firings when I was employed by Rocketdyne, uh, I know that uh, the jet of the lunar mod module lander, the lunar lander, would have created an enormous crater. It, it would have scoured the moon's surface. It would have tossed up rocks, sand, everything, and created a crater maybe so large that the entire lunar lander could have sunk into it. After all, we're dealing with a 10,000 pound thrust engine which is pointed directly at the surface, lowered into the surface, and yet if you look at pictures of the lunar lander on the moon, there is no disturbance whatsoever under the lunar lander's rocket. And no dust deposited in the pads, the cup-shaped pads at the bottom. That's another good point dust would have been blown <laughs> six ways from Sunday and would have landed everywhere. And then the famous scene which has been played over and over where they are landing, they're, they're setting down and you're hearing the astronaut talking through it. Oh that's a good point. Uh, I, I, lo I, I uh, let's say became aware of that only recently that here's uh, uh, Neil Armstrong talking about landing on the moon uh, with a microphone and yet he is sitting practically on top of a rocket engine that is putting out sound levels of about 140 or 150 decibels. Now we know that that is absolutely impossible to overcome that sound level inside the lunar lander with a normal human voice. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. Roger, copy. Eagle, Houston, after y'all around. Angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, y'all, plus one eight. Roger, you're a go to, con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Alarm. Altitude 1600. 1,400 feet. Still looking very good. 700 feet, 21 down. 33 degrees. 100 feet down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go, same type, we're go. Altitude, velocity, light, and ass down, 220 feet. 15 forward. 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down, five and a half down. 60 seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. down two and a half, picking up some dust. Four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. Good. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Okay, we've uh, changed our graphic picture here in the background, and um, it's a one-sheet poster that I uh, put together from pictures on the website www.geocities.com slash Apollo Reality slash and the gentleman that put this together got actually these images off the Langley Research Center website 
And uh, some of these, actually, you're just seeing for the first time yourself. Isn't that right, Bill? That's right, yeah. I'm amazed to find these uh, pictures. I've never seen uh, any of them before except the one in the upper right. And what amazes me is this one here showing uh, a model of the moon with a camera track showing how easily it would have been to uh, uh, fake the uh, filming of the moon. And then the image just to the right of that shows like the finished moon. Exactly. <laughs> With somebody sitting at the controls, maybe turning it or, or... Right. These are very revealing pictures and I strongly recommend people with PCs to uh, download them and uh, study them. And of course this brings up the subject of the death of, of whistleblowers. Men like Gus Grissom, who was burned to death, along with Chafee and White. He went because, pretty, pretty open with it, putting a lemon on well, the... Uh, yeah, he, he was very... He was going to give an interview about what he really thought about Apollo. And as you say, he hung a lemon on the cap, command capsule on the day that he was murdered. And we should also look at uh, Scott Grissom, his son's evidence, that a secret switch was installed in the, the capsule to ignite the fire that killed Grissom, Chafee, and White. Uh, we could go on for quite a while about the death and injury to people that have pursued this uh, Apollo hoax subject very diligently. Uh, they went to a NASA spokesman who was Brian Welch, Oh, yes, and right. They asked him about some of these anomalies. Right. You recall what he had, uh, what he said about some of the, the things well, that were asking he, him? He, he tried to dispute everything that, that the Apollo hoax advocates brought out. But the interesting thing is that about a month after he gave this interview, he was dead. That always kind of puzzled me because he was at least trying to right. hold on right. to it, right? So right. Do you think they would have actually killed him just because he didn't do a good enough job? Or? Yes, I think that's what happened. He didn't do a good enough job. So they killed him as an example to other people uh, who are defending, like Richard Hoagland. Hoagland obviously is a fake, and uh, he's, he's a, uh, an employee of NASA who on many occasions has tried to discredit me and, and my associates. There are much better mysteries that call into question some of the photography, which I agree with you, looks frankly hoaxed. Yeah, well, some of it could have been staged and they could have released it, Richard. Exactly. That's yeah. what some of my photographic experts that I've called in over the years, you know, and I've been to Goddard, I've looked at the NSSD film. I mean, I have examples, actual examples, Eric, of NASA airbrushing the moon. Well, I, I know, I know this. And, uh, but, but you see, I have a different model. So you're and saying they faked some of the photos? I think they faked some photos. I think they've hidden other things in the photos, and I'll give you my bottom line. I think there is an enormous Apollo conspiracy, but I think we've been sold the wrong conspiracy to keep people like you, bright guys who are asking good questions, looking in the wrong direction, which these people are past masters at doing, because the real conspiracy is not that we go to the moon, it's what did we find on the moon oh, no, there's that aliens they don't there. want us to know. And as I said earlier in the show, I found areas where NASA faked the imagery, I believe, to hide really cool stuff. Okay. And I found other people. areas where the photographs are consistent with us landing on the moon. And it's possible, Richard, that some of these beauty shots were staged and they threw them in there and grouped them in with the real ones. Exactly. Next up, let's go to our wild card line. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Our next speaker is Professor James McKinney. If you double the size of your rocket, you don't double the size of your payload. So you're very limited. And now let's try and get to the next planet or out to the moon. We have to start sending individual things up there, couple them together, and then go out to these other planets. Uh, by the way, there's a small problem with going to the moon and inch by inch NASA is leaking out that they know that there's a problem there. It's called the Van Allen belts, high radiation belts of charged particles around Earth and we don't know how to get through them, they say. 
Well, isn't that interesting because there sure didn't seem to be a problem back in 1969. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't go to the moon. The United States did not go to the moon. The Russians knew it all along. Uh, I thought at the time we did, but I've since learned we absolutely did not. And there's no question about it. And they're starting to figure it out. NASA has a program called Living with a Star. That's a pretty name for how do we get through the Van Allen belts. They have all their top scientists working on it. It's a tremendous problem because we do not have any kind of a spacecraft that we can send up that doesn't have metal in it. And when these charged particles hit metal, they produce x-rays. Nothing you can do to get around that. So anybody sitting around something metal in outer space in the Van Allen belts is going to be French fried. And so that whole thing was a giant hoax. And you have second and third tier scientists in the United States who are running around saying, oh, yes, we did, yes, we did. But the very top level people, what I call the tier one scientists, the black op mill scientists, know for a fact we didn't go. And it's a real problem. They don't know how to get through there. This picture is with the new Hubble camera. And it shows that, in fact, if you take this angular distance out to Pluto and you translate it into the surface of the moon, we can, in fact, resolve the landing sites, the alleged lunar landing sites. And the way you would do this is you take the pictures at dusk when the shadows became very long and it would be a very hard thing for them to fake. So at any rate, we have telescopes on Earth that are much larger than the Hubble. Much better resolving power. So why, you would think these astronomers would be chomping at the bit to show you those lunar landing sites. And look at the incredible resolving power of this telescope we have here. Why have none of them done that? because there ain't nothing there. And we get all kinds of excuses. Oh, we can't turn the telescope up there because the moon's too bright. Well, then all of a sudden we saw the full moon on a web page, on a NASA web page, the entire full moon taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you're telling me they can't take one little teeny patch of the moon, which is millions of times less bright. So bottom line is they know they didn't go. Join us now on a quest for the truth to the moon. In this film, we shall not only prove beyond all reasonable doubt that many of the official NASA images of lunar exploration are fake, but we shall also examine the motives for the biggest lie put before the world. Why did NASA repeatedly fake lunar images and photographs? Why did NASA stage lunar expeditions which did not happen? The answer will surprise you. NASA spent gigantic sums of money during the 1960s. But most of it was spent on the ground, not in space. Huge American corporations, many of which were manufacturing hardware for the military, made gigantic profits designing space vehicles and more importantly, life-sized models of spaceships and even huge stage sets resembling the lunar surface. Someone in NASA had realized that after taking billions of dollars from the American people, if they couldn't make it to the moon, they would fake it to the moon. Obviously, if you're going to somewhere that nobody has been before, you need to have a simulator which recreates that environment as closely as you can. If you're going to the moon, you recreate the surface of the moon. And here we see a section of the lunar surface created it's about 30 foot high, 30 foot long, 35 foot long. 
scale is given by the two people standing in front of me. There were plenty of simulation exercises, but the point is, and this is, should be taken into account in virtually everything that is discussed with the Apollo program, 400,000 people may have worked on the program in total, but none of them had a need to know more than his own job required. The people who were making the rockets didn't know what the people who were making the spacesuits were doing because they had no need to know about that. Their job was to make the best models and the best uh, simulation of the lunar surface that they could. And if we come up to this picture here, we see the three scales on which these models were built. We have here the whole moon as one unit. It stands about 20 foot high. We have here behind it a section of the surface of the moon. You'll notice it's curved. And here we have a more detailed section of the lunar surface. What you're saying is that the images which we are told show a camera pointing out the window of the lunar module as it's coming into land on the moon could well have been filmed previously using these large-scale models. That's right. It could well be that what we are looking at are films of realistic models. We have no means of knowing if they were actually taken on the lunar surface or whether what we're watching is part of the simulation exercise and the training exercise. And you'll notice here on these models there is a camera track. A camera starting at this end coming down here would approach the moon or appear to approach the moon and become ever closer towards it. This is a simulation rig that was built. Uh, this is the command and service module of the Apollo program. And you'll notice that the window here looks out onto a block here. And there's another one here. They're curved. These are the screens onto which the lunar surface was projected as the craft made a simulated approach towards the lunar surface. Is what we're seeing a mixture of fact and fiction. It is fact. It is fiction. It's mixed together. It's hard to separate them until you examine it closely. If a spacecraft is in deep space, the only possible explanation for a light seen through the window of the spacecraft is the sun. It's the only bright light in space. If it's not the sun, then it has to be some other artificial light which implies that that particular image is possibly fiction. July 1961. NASA was soon being criticized for the flimsy construction of their hardware. The first orbital capsules did not even have windows in them for the astronauts to look out of. One of the most vocal critics was one of NASA's most respected astronauts, an all-American hero named Virgil Gus Grissom, who almost drowned when recovery helicopters were unable to lift his space capsule from the sea. After a successful journey into space, Gus Grissom almost died through NASA's bad planning. Or was this an early attempt to silence Gus Grissom? May 1963. Astronaut Gordon Cooper experiences re-entry problems in his Faith 7 rocket ship. The prototype lunar module, known as the LIM, had serious stability problems. At this stage, there was no guarantee that even if NASA managed to get a spaceship orbiting the moon, they could land safely without killing the crew. Could 
the footage which we see of the limb approaching the moon be filmed in a TV studio? It was filmed in a TV studio. There's absolutely no doubts whatsoever about that. And the way that this film was created was by the use of models. There's nothing secret about the models. They exist, you can go and see them today. The models were very lifelike, very realistic. There is one that is a life-size model. It's in Flagstaff in Arizona. It's two miles long, and it's an exact replica of the Sea of Tranquility. The photographs were used to create from those images the replica of the Sea of Tranquility, so that if it was flown over in a helicopter, it would appear as if it was a spacecraft approaching a similar area to land. So yes, all the scenes of the lunar surface were filmed on Earth. Radiation and without having spacesuits nor spacecraft which can protect the occupants from radiation, NASA convinced the American people to pay $40 billion for the space program. The most lethal forms of radiation, of course, are at the higher end of the spectrum. That's gamma rays and x-rays. Uh, we know what ultraviolet can do. If you stay out too long in the sun, you get sunburn and skin cancer and die, and it's all very sad. But gamma rays, and x-rays especially, are particularly lethal to humans, unprotected humans. There was no protection that I have been able to identify. I've been found no reference to it. I found nothing that will tell me what level of protection is offered. So I have to assume none was. I've contacted the manufacturers of the spacesuits and they said there was no radiation protection built into the spacesuits because I asked them if these same spacesuits could be used by technicians to go into Chernobyl or Three Mile Island because the nuclear reactors produce the same radiation as produced in space. They said no, not advisable, no protection. James Van Allen grew up in the small Iowa town of Mount Pleasant during the 1920s. He was an exceptional student, became class valedictorian, and exhibited an intense vision that even then looked beyond our planet. The environment was the time of the Cold War, and it was this something scary. It was something for a child that seemed very scary to have to talk, hear about bomb shelters and hiding under our desks. And I remember first hearing that my father was going to go to Russia and being fright, so frightened by that and asking my father what, why was he going to Russia? It wasn't he scared. And I remember him explaining to me that in the scientific community, what they do and as they take data and exchange data, somehow that transcends what is going on in the political arena. So that there is always a sense that the uh, quest for intellectual activity was something very special remember that so that the Cold War suddenly didn't seem very cold to me even as a young child. In Washington, the media focused on the Explorer 1 achievement as at last legitimizing the U.S. as a worthy adversary to confront the communist Sputniks. The public seemed captivated with the propaganda created by this new space race. Dr. Van Allen and his students, however, chose to focus on the data that was returning from their scientific instrument inside Explorer 1. When the first results came back, the, the group at the University of Iowa, this was uh, Van Allen and Ernie Ray then, began to help with it, eventually Carl McElwain, uh, saw immediately that there was an anomaly, there was something unexpected. We have encountered a very great in increase in radiation intensity, which is vastly beyond what could be due to cosmic rays alone. We call it geomagnetically trapped radiation. And I gave an explanation of what, uh, my interpretation at a press conference following the uh, scientific session. 
and one of the reporters uh, says, uh, stood up and he was trying to visualize what I was saying and he said you mean it encircles the earth like a belt I said yes that's great that's that's what it is it's like a belt around the earth and so that's the way they got the name of radiation belt from this exchange of this uh, newspaper reporter and myself well certainly the uh, discovery of the radiation belts uh, was the most uh, important discovery of the international geophysical year because it represented a discovery of some major phenomenon that had a, a substantial impact both on scientific research and on plans for manned flight later on. In late 1958 and early 1959, Van Allen flew instruments on Pioneers 3 and 4. Both were unsuccessful attempts to hit the moon, but their flights provided the Iowa group with essential confirming data. Pioneer 3 documented the existence of a second radiation belt, and Pioneer 4 became the first U.S. spacecraft to orbit the sun. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No, now I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. Say that I'm not a chemist, I'm not a geologist or an anthropologist. I'm a, uh, an, a retired electrical engineer. I've worked at NASA Goddard for over 20 years. Uh, I'm retired now and I have um, worked with image processing, which is a uh, similar to some of the uh, things that are done on computers today. However, at the time that I made my, I did my work, uh, the, the computers that are so well established today were not available. So I... Yeah, hello. I like your presentation uh, very, uh, very much, but uh, I got a couple of questions here. First one is, what, if any, are the differences between you and uh, Richard Hoagland concerning the politics on the cover-up? And part two is, uh, what's the difference between you and Mr. Hoagland concerning the scientific implications of the face, especially since uh, Richard Hoagland kind of brings in hyperdimensional physics into the picture of, of the face on Mars? Thank you. Okay, um, the one thing I'd like to clarify, I should have done at the beginning, um, Richard Hoagland and myself are like oil and water. Uh, the second thing is that, um, and I'll go into the third thing, is that uh, Richard comes up with ideas where he does not have groundwork or supporting evidence, not even evidence, not, and certainly not proof that things exist where they don't. For instance, I've seen some of his work where he has found swastikas and German tanks on Mars, <laughs> and he has found cathedrals on the moon Europa of Jupiter that resemble burnt out cathedrals from World War II in uh, Europe, and various other things which not only can't be proved, but they aren't even evidence, and I stay as far away from him as I can. And I, there was a the last part of your question concerned, I, I forget exactly. Yes, uh, uh, he always talks about hyperdimensional physics okay. and he comes up with all these formulas on, on the dimensions of, of the, also the pyramid on Mars, you know, and, and all these, you know, he, you know, in his book he has all these uh, geometric configurations and he tries to bring in hyperdimensional physics. It's hard enough for me to give evidence and present it at conferences with facts that I can show to scientists. But to, to try to back up something with a relationship to another planet is so hypothetical that it, has, it just doesn't have the substance to hold up. Most scientists would classify that under the term of numerology and not have anything to do with it. 